Uh, sorry, I'm so late. I left my last class a little early, kind of meandering over here, and all of a sudden it was 27 after, and I was like, oh, so apologies. Um, so we'll get right into it. Uh, today, um, there's, uh, there is a lecture notebook, so definitely go check it out. Uh, hopefully it's got a little bit more written in it, so it'll be a little easier to follow along. Um, but we'll see how it goes. Uh, so that first announcement shouldn't be on there. I thought I, thought I deleted it. It's not um, for another day, so don't worry about that. Uh, lecture labs, we talked about that. Um, okay, so one thing to remember is that accommodations uh, regarding any uh, learning disabilities or anything like that, uh, you need to get them to us by February 22nd so that we can actually do something about it before the midterm exam. Um, and, you know, talk to the Office for Disability Services and they'll assess whatever you might need and hopefully we'll be able to make accommodations that make it easier to participate in the class. Any questions? All right. Uh, also, I heard somebody talking over there about it'd be cool if this class did something. Let us know about those kinds of things because uh, then maybe we can do them, but we have to think of them first. <laughs> So shoot me an email or something. Um, okay, so uh, this is a little bit on the uh, bull shrimp side of things where when you uh, are presenting data um, and when you are viewing kind of other people's data, um, keep in mind that it's not always gonna be obvious the conclusions you're supposed to draw. So this was a graph that they did uh, resolution is really quite bad, isn't it? I thought it was a little bit better. Um, but as you can see, when these bush tax cuts expire, um, there's going to be a huge jump right in taxes. Okay, except it's a little bit disingenuous because the scale is here. I don't know if you all can read that. It's like it's, it's much worse resolution on this than I expected. Um, this is 34, and that's 42. Okay, so it's going to make the gap quite look quite a bit larger than it is in reality. Okay, so while it is technically accurate, it is definitely giving the impression of something much worse than if you kind of show something in context. Make sense? Good question. No, another thing I want to point out. It actually, this also does this at the top after the hit. Right, right, right. Which is kind of going, you know, it's it's just a little up here. You're right. So so this isn't even across the board, it's just one group. Um, but you know, that aside, there's you know, uh, there's often when you have one disingenuous thing, there's often a lot of them. Um, but the one I really want to point out here is that that scale of that graph can really make a difference to your perceived understanding of it um, because this is a data science class and not a political science class we will talk too much about the rest of it how's that so uh i do tend to be a little bit biased towards it because uh, my mother was a political scientist so i tend to shy towards it but so does that make sense to everybody that it's uh you know if you don't if you don't give the context or make it really clear right you know, if you blew this font up or something and made it really obvious that this is just a snapshot of the very top chunk, you know, that's another way to do it. But that's kind of the idea. So, moving on from there, we're going to talk about distributions. Uh, and we're going to start theoretically with a Jupyter notebook. However, the correct Jupyter notebook. All right, apparently there's a typo in my Jupyter notebook because I think that is right. I just think I must have had typed in lecture eight. Um, let me just make sure I'm on the right one. Yeah, yeah, it's the same on the root too. Uh, I just uh, uh, must have been a typo. Okay, so. Let's see. So the first thing we got to do is run this one. And then actually, as it might come up later, 
Um, this cell, which is just kind of prose, okay, is a special language called Markdown. Um, and it's just kind of a way of writing so that uh, you can make it look pretty. But if you notice, the reason that's a Markdown cell and not a code cell is just this little drop down here. Um, but so I can easily change this to seven, and now it's all done. All right, so first thing we're going to do is read this movie table. And then we want to clean up the data in here a bit. And I don't think, yeah. So what we're going to do here is we did this last time. That's why I'm not really kind of going over it. But what we're doing here is uh, making a new column called millions. And what we're doing is taking the gross uh, receipts. And you can't just pull a column off, but dividing by a million um, and so that we can put it in terms of millions just so that the number's a little easier to read, right? Um, and then we pull off the top uh, 10 of those movies, you know, and then, uh, you know, and we throw it into a horizontal bar chart. Okay, so I just want to get you a sense of the data. Um, but then we're actually going to go from there, we're going to actually take it a step further. And what if I only want the studios column out of that database or out of the table? Select. Oops. But I hit a period. And then what do I select? Yeah. Right. And assuming I can type it correctly. All right. Oops. Let me print it so you can see what happened in theory. All right. And so there's the studio's column, um, but as a table, right? So that's still a table. So the first thing we can do is we can actually look at, let's say, so if we think about, sorry, I should have put it a little bit closer. So in these movie studios, right? So we have about 200 rows because there were how many rows in the actual data? If we just look up here, there's about 200 rows. So do you think the studios, there's only one, like is, is every movie have a different studio? Probably not, right? So it means we probably have repeats of studio in here. So what we might wanna do, if we're trying to look at how we think about the, the studios themselves, we can do, something like this, which we call a distribution. Oop. Is it studio or studios? Yeah. And then and so What that gives us, if we use this group command and we tell it what column we want, it'll go through the whole list and pull out or count up the number of studio or number of times it sees the studio. So that when this the studio here has 35 movies in our data set. All right. So this is super useful. Uh, so something to definitely remember because um, you'll probably be using it a lot. Um, and then to kind of cross check ourselves, and I think you've heard me say this many times before, but I like to cross check things because otherwise I'm not sure I didn't make any mistakes. So does anybody have an idea for how I might cross check this to make sure that the counts are correct? Just kind of to get a feel for it. Yeah, so if you add them up, it should be equal to 200. Um, and I'm not going to ask the group because I don't think we've actually covered this, but so we can use a function called, sorry, a function called sum um, on our data. There we go. 
and choose the column that we want because if we do column here, right, that will actually give us an array. And we know the column is called count because that's the one it generated when it created the count. And so if we sum an array, it'll just add all the numbers together. And as, as expected, we get 200. So it should be the same number of rows, right? Or same number as the number of rows. So we can be pretty confident that you, we didn't make any mistakes. All right. Let me just. Yeah, I had this problem last time. I need to fix it too. Um, so going back to the slide to talk about distribution. So this is just a formal definition, right? Um, and so we have in the distribution, we have like an individual and that's whose features are recorded. And so a feature, so a variable is a feature, an attribute or a variable has different values. So in other words, like we have a bunch of names for the same thing that we use kind of interchangeably. And that's what these are um, for a variable, right? Variable, feature, attribute. Values can be numerical or categorical, we talked about last time. Um, and then of many subtypes within that, right? Because you might have like numerical that's integers, or you might have numerical that is floats or something else. Um, each individual has exactly one value of variable. Okay. So in other words, uh, you, you wouldn't have two rows in there for the same movie with two different revenue amounts, right? Because it's not clear what that means. Right? It's like, am I supposed to add those together? Is it actually two different movies with exactly the same name? You know, so it's you got to be really careful that you only should have uh, the same, you know, one row is unique. Does that make sense? I think it's obvious, but you know, I would like to ask. Um, and then distribution for each different value of that variable, the frequency of individuals that have that value. Okay, so when we talk about the distribution, it's if you think about it kind of like, you know, how is it distributed, right? Like um, you know, so if you're distributing candy to the classroom, you know, how many pieces of candy do we give to each person? Uh, so we distribute things. So what we're looking at is how did we distribute? Okay, does that make sense? All right. Sorry, switching windows. And now we have a question. Maybe, there we go. All right, so what can values be? So what are, what are our choices for the values? Almost. All right, I'm calling it there. Oh, we got one more. Are we going to get it? All right, let's go. All right, so a lot of people chose either. And either is the correct answer. Um, so obviously numerical and categorical, categorical are both sort of right. It's just that it could be any of them. Or it could be either of them, either. All right. So now if we want to talk about the distribution of categorical variables, um, this is where those horizontal bar charts really start to shine. And so Sorry, switch on windows. If I can ever find my mouse again. So we looked at this a little bit, but now we can actually do something interesting. Uh, what is this tab? Um, by taking the horizontal bar chart of our newly created data, right? So let me scroll that a little bit more. So you won't be able to see the top of it. I probably should have cut it off, but. Um, and so now we put a count down here. So we, we created the data for this graph, right? So we first 
you know, grouped them together and did a count. So we figured out how many uh, movies each of these uh, studios did, um, and then we can display them on a, on a horizontal bar chart, uh, which, you know, is a little easier to consume than, you know, kind of the straight set of numbers. Uh, but we can also start to look at patterns. Uh, so, So I know a bunch of the people who make this operating system that I'm using, and uh, I think I want to ask them to say, if I'm sharing a screen, can I get a copy of that screen over here? So then I could see what I was typing, um, which I think would be super nice. Okay, so now what I can do is I can do all this kind of normal operations that we were doing before, except on our new data. Nope. I spelled true correctly. At least this means everyone's keeping up for sure because I am a terrible typist today. Most days. So assuming I type that correctly, um, now we can get the exact same thing except with a somewhat better layout, right? So we can now actually sort them so that the, you know, once the most movies are top uh, and as we go down. All right, one of the things I always like to ask though is, so if I go and run this again without the sort, will I get that result up here or will I get this result? If I take out this sort now. Question make sense? Yeah. You get the first one, right? Because this operation here, did not modify this. We didn't reassign it. All we did was daisy chain command box. Yeah. Uh, that's a good question. So the question is like, how do you know what the order is in a sense? And um, oddly enough, I almost think of it like you think of the, as math. Um, so you always go in order unless there's parentheses, right? So if you read this as if it was math, the first thing that happens is this gets passed to this sort function and some table gets resulted because these parens are first. And then the next thing that happens is this gets passed into this RH function um, based on this one, because that's what the dot means. So I take my initial table, I make a new table with the sort command because I'm going in order, right? Um, and then I get that table back and then I take and go create a, a graph based on the studio column, but I don't make the graph. So the order is always kind of from left to right, okay? And if you try it in reverse, it'll be very obvious that you're wrong because this doesn't actually return a table. So if you try to sort it, it's really going to be angry with you. But in short, you always go left to right, honoring parentheses. That make sense? Yeah. All right. I think we are going to talk about those. So. And then, oh, sorry, I switched my screen and not that one. All right, so uh, so bar charts are very commonly used to, to look at categorical information. Um, like I said, I think you're probably, I know I was, you know, mostly used to vertical bar charts, but horizontal ones are really good if there's a lot of long strings. One axis will be categorical and one will be numeric. Okay, or, excuse me, or numerical. Make sense? All right, but it, do, it doesn't matter which is which, right? That's why we can put it horizontal and it doesn't make any difference, right? We could have the studios in the bottom and the numbers up the side, but then it would be a vertical bar graph. Okay, and then going to the next slide. 
So the distribution of the variable, so or a column, for example, studio, describes the frequency of its different values. Um, and so basically it's, you know, how often does it occur? That's what we mean by frequency. Um, and the group method counts the number of rows for each value in the column. And we have the little group with the little eyeglass or, uh, or I think it's called magnifying glass there because we're going to use it a lot. So make sure you know it. Um, and then, you know, for example, in this case, the number of top movies released by each studio. And then uh, the bar chart displays the distribution of categorical variables. We get a bar for each category. The blank length of the bar is the count of individuals in that category. And you can choose the order of the bars, usually, right, in, with some mechanism. Um, you know, if you really want to, you could make a new table, right, with using take and put them in whatever order you wanted to. Um, but it's important to note this, and this kind of goes, harkens back to that first slide, right, is that the bar graph height of things, like the length of the bars, should be kind of relatively in context. Uh, to make it clear what you're trying to tell people. All right, now we have a question. Maybe. All right, this should be a gimme. All right, so what's the best graph for a categorical variable? All right, last answers. I should really put a timer on these so that I have I have no idea how long it's taking, but it always feels like too long. All right, so it looks like most people got it correct. Uh, we're gonna talk about these other ones, um, but most of these have to do with numbers. So it's a little different. All right, so let's talk about the distribution of numerical variables. So let me just actually let me just look at what the next slide is. Yeah. Okay. So when we look at numerical variables, that didn't print what I was expecting. There we go. So when we look at these distributions, right? So we do things like let's take the age out um, by doing a little math. We know that 2019 is the top, right? So we can say let's just subtract the year from 2019 and we'll get the ages of all those movies, right? So Donald Penn came out 80 years ago, uh, actually, well, 84, three years ago. Um, and then top movies uh, with the column ages. So we're gonna put that ages column back on the top movies uh, and then display the results. However, I think we are not gonna move on until we do the next slide. I wonder if I should just stay here. It's one of those questions. So, oops. So let's talk about binning. Okay. And so, in short, binning is to turn numerical data into categorical data. Okay. And why or how do we do that? Right. So, what we do is we put our numbers into bins, okay? Um, and so, as I I've said, you know, before, like last time, uh, I taught this or whatever. Whenever I hear the word binning, I think of two things. One, have you ever been through airport security, right? And you know the bins they have in the security, or maybe you've seen a picture or whatever, like throwing all the stuff in those bins and then you know getting yelled at a lot. Um, the other one I think of a lot too is in the UK where binning is when you throw something out. Um, and so that's neither of these. It's kind of like the trash idea, except we're not going to throw stuff away. So the bins are defined by the lower bound, and they're inclusive on the lower and exclusive on the upper. Um, and so just kind of like the same as we do everything else. So 
uh, we look at where 188 would go. So 188, pretty easy, right? It goes in that far, I guess, right for you, Ben. Uh, and then we have 170, which goes in that bin between 170 and 175. But then we have, you know, the slightly trickier one, right, which is 189. So but that goes in that same bin because it's still within the upper bound because it's below the top number. All right. And then we're going to ask the crowd, where does 163 go? Uh, yeah. First bin? Yeah. So assuming my, assuming my uh, PowerPoint skills are up to snuff, they will show up in the right place. Um, all right, so, all right, next one is 183. What do you got? Sounds right to me. Uh, and then 171, somebody from over there. All right, you. Nice, all right, 185. How about back there, somebody? Yeah, there you go, um, because that's the lower bound, right? And then I think we have the last one. I think I just dropped the last ones in. Um, so hopefully you get the idea, right? So, you know, the bottom is inclusive, the top is exclusive, just like everything else we've been talking about. Um, but it's this is another one where, you know, I kind of mentioned bins here um, because this is an important concept that you're gonna use a lot. All right, so now we have a question. All right, last question's in. All right, I'm calling it there. All right, so sadly, D is not the correct answer uh, as much as you would like it to be. Um, so this is slightly new terminology that I introduced on the slide, right? So upper bound, it's just the kind of more formal way of saying top, right? And lower bound is the kind of more formal way of saying the bottom, okay? Um, and so that's what, what those are called generally. Uh, but, you know, kind of using any of that terminology is, is close enough most of the time. All right. Now we're going to talk about the area principle. And so, notice my. Uh, my splash is a little off, but what's wrong with this picture? Right, so this picture, you know, this is the old iPad and this is the new iPad, and it says it's 100% bigger. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody we haven't heard from yet today? All right, how are you, Trey? Right. So, so this thing, so this thing is more like four x. Okay. So, like four hundred percent bigger, you know, or maybe maybe not that. Maybe it's like three hundred or something. But this picture and that picture, this is not a hundred percent bigger. Okay, it is definitely more than that, right? So why do they do this? Yeah, it's more, right? It's they they just want they just want to make sure it's clear that it's more, okay? But this is kind of similar to that first thing: is that your uh, graphs, your pictures, whatever, should be um, shouldn't be disingenuous. So 
This is referred to as the area principle, which is the area to be proportional to the values they represent. So if you imagine we have a, a you know a simple example here, right? Um, where I forgot this was a build slide. So this is a hundred percent bigger than this, right? That is not. Okay. So they should match. And so if you think about it in terms of like a bar chart, right? Um, those you know, the width of the of the bars, like thinking of horizontal bar chart, the width of those bars should be the same all the way across the board, and the length of them should be the same, you know, given the whatever number they're supposed to have. So if I look at two different things that, you know, the count of movies or whatever, and they're both 30, those two bars should be the same length. Okay, some of it seems a little obvious, but I think when you're doing, you know, if you are doing a drawing or something like that, or trying to build a graph, that this to this is an easy mistake to make. Okay, so just think about it whenever you're trying to make a graph that looks like that, that, you know, the, the one, you know, the one size is proportional to the other size in actuality, not just in, you know, what you feel like looks like. All right. Let me just check. Yeah, so before we go on to that, we're going to go to, wait, no, we're not, are we? Yeah, no, we're going to stay here, sorry. Um, so drawing histograms. So a histogram is displays the distribution of a numerical variable or attribute. It uses bins, so there's one bar corresponding to each bin, and then it uses the area principle so that the area of each bar is just a set of individuals with corresponding bins. Okay, so what does that mean? So a histogram is kind of different from a bar chart in that you have to look at the size of the bar, okay, to see, I don't have a picture of one right now, but uh, so we'll talk about one in a second, but to see how much is in that label bucket, you actually have to look at the size of the thing because they won't be uniform in width or height. Does that make sense? So, I know I find that slightly confusing. Um, so let's talk about it with an example. Okay, so I've got my table of studios up here with the ages, right, of the movies. Um, oh, I forgot, I have my picture. No, it didn't work. Fail. Because, See if that works. Oh yeah, there's the there's the airport bins. I knew I had a picture. Um, okay, so with these ages, okay, so we've introduced this new piece of data, right? And what we want to do is we want to group them by age. Okay, but to do that, we want to use bins. Okay, so we want to say, I think my example uses like. Actually, that's kind of the point. Is first thing we need to know is. What, what is the first thing we need to know to decide what size bins we should make? The range of values. What's the range of the values? And how do we get that? Uh, do you know? Like the highest minus the lowest. Um, you don't necessarily need to even go that far, but essentially, yes. So you can just do. Right, because this is just for us, right? So I'm just going to do min ages and max ages just so I can see what's the top and the bottom or the bottom and the top, I suppose. Right. And so now I know that the oldest movie in the bucket is 98 years old and the youngest is two. Okay. So as of 2019, so I, I should have gone back and updated the date, but I guess I forgot. Uh, all right. So, so now what I want to do is create those bits okay do you have a question or no or yeah yeah maybe hey it's possible all right so there's the table oops 
Is that what you wanted to see? Oh, okay. Yep. So that might be a little too big to be able to read it all. All right, so that's how we get to this ages thing. And then let's move from there. So now we have a min and a max. And so now we need to make our bins. So as you might imagine, it's pretty easy. Um, and so we're gonna do my bins and we're gonna say make array. There's also a dot on the screen, so I can't always tell if I have a typo in that spot. 10, 15, 25, 40. 65. All right, so now if you notice, these are not evenly distributed, right? The first few are, but then we go into much bigger buckets, okay? Um, and so they don't have to be evenly distributed. It's just, these are just gonna be the bins we wanna use. And the ones I showed in the first example have to be evenly distributed, they don't have to be. Why did I choose, well, the zero I think is relatively obvious, but why did I choose the zero for the start of the bins? Yeah. Right, so I didn't mean that so much as like just from straight what I have on the screen. Yeah. So you're correct, but I, I meant in a broader context. Arguable, right? Because I, that's why I went and did the min. So arguably, I could have made this two, and it would have been the same, right? But the point is, is that it needs to be equal to or less, right? Than the smallest thing I have. Okay. And then what about the hundred? Anybody else? How about you in the back over there? Yeah. Yeah, so the max is 98. So if I made this 98, would that be better? Anyone? Right on. So I will say, generally speaking, it's a good idea if your bins are only as big as the data set. So I probably should have done two in 99. Okay. But, you know, it's an example. So now what I can do is I can bin them. And if you think about the UK term, I think that's funny. But I am going to cut and paste that one just for a little bit of speed. Um, so what I did was now I created the bins using this bin function on this column, right? And then Oh, and just like the descending equals true, this is another name parameter, and we're going to pass it my bins here. All right, and so we get basically the bins, and then how many of the things are in the bins. Does that make sense? All right. And then we, you know, like I said before, I like to do cross checking. So we can oh. oh my goodness, column. Now this is another one, which is a generated name. So the name of this column, right? We didn't specify it. It just created it and decided to add and call it age count because now like we don't have like studio here and count here. We, you know, we just have bin, right? So it, it, it combines the column name with the word count. So you know, you know, you can guess what the column name will be. Uh, it, so it tries to be consistent like that. All right, so now let's bin it slightly differently. Um, and we don't always have to use a variable. So we can actually do 
age like this. And then we'll say bins equals. And then what would be, let's say we did want to do an even distribution of them. And we'll do it by 25 or like blocks of 25 years. And we tell me what, what we need to type in now. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Oh, okay. So first thing I did was I made an array called my bins. And then I passed my bins as the bins parameter to this function called bin. There's a lot of the word bin in that, so which makes it slightly confusing. But that's all we're doing is that we created an array. We assign this array to this parameter called bin when we call the method bin with the column name age and a set of bins. Okay, maybe I'll show it to you. Let me show you this real quick first, and that might make it a little easier to understand. So I don't have to give it bins at all. Okay, but if we do. Wow. So what it's going to do is it'll actually look at the data and do evenly distributed bins. Okay. So in this case, what I did was I took, said I told the function bin, here's whatever bins you want. Okay. But I don't always want to do that. What I sometimes want to do is specify what the bins are. So much like I could do sort ascending true. So theoretically, the change won't be much, but. So here in the sort function, I use the descending equals true as a name parameter. If you notice, I tend to leave spaces around equals when it's it, to make it more readable. Here, I think it's really obvious because the color change and that kind of stuff. That's why I don't tend to type the space there, but they're both equally valid. It's that why. Um, so then, and then this time I'm declaring what the bins look like. I'm using a sorted table, but that doesn't make any difference because it's going to go through all of them anyway um, and put them in the right bin. Okay. So back to my original question, which was missing the bin. So now how could I get a set of bins, but I don't want to take the default. I want size 25 bins. Yeah. So yes, but I don't have to actually create a variable. I can just do it right here. MPA range, exactly. So MPA range. And what should the parameters to A range be? Okay, so zero. All right, so I'm not going to run this because I can tell you right now it's wrong. Why is it wrong? It's exclusive, right? So if I actually want that bin to be a 25 size bin, this needs to be 101, right? I live for off by one of it. Oh, I know. Like I said, I make them all the time. Um, all right, so there's our bins, right? So, can anybody tell me why this bin is empty? Yeah. Right. So, we didn't have any movies that were 100 years old. Right? We had the largest one we had was 98. 
So this is the bottom number of the bid. Okay. So as a result, that was empty. And what you might think, like 98 or whatever, gets in this bid. So I don't know. When I first looked at this, I was I don't know why, but I don't realize that that was uh, the lower number, right? But it's always the lower number. All right. And then what if we do? Lost my cheat sheet. Um, So what's going to happen if I do this? Like I'll run it, but like, what's what's the problem with doing this? Yeah. Well, sixty, but yeah. The over sixty. Um, so that's a lot of the Right. So you're throwing away a bunch of data, which may be something you want to do, right? Um, but it's to be cautious of. The other thing that's weird here too, right, is that the bins are 25 each, right? So ending at 60 is a little bit odd. Okay. So you're gonna have one bin that's a different size than the rest. Make sense? Like one of size 10, not 25. All right. And then let me just see what the. Yeah. All right. So now we'll show some histograms. Um, so that was our original my bins. And so we're going to keep that. And we also have the bin data, which looks like that. So now we can make a histogram. Um, so top movies. Anybody have any guesses about how to make a histogram? Who did the reading? All right, how about you? Yeah, dot hist. H-I-S-T. Why is it dot hist? We're too lazy to write out histogram. So. It's not hist. Then we pass it the column we care about, and then the bins if we want to. So actually, hold on, I'll talk about that in a second. Once I finish mangling it. Bins. Okay. So the other thing that you know, okay whenever I give a name parameter like this, is that it will, it does have a default. So it has one that it will do on its own if you don't specify, okay? So in this case, we're gonna give it the histogram, we're gonna give it the age column that we care about, the bins, the ones we defined up here, and then what is the thing, like what's the thing that's gonna do, we're gonna do the binning on, okay? And so then we end up with, Instagram. And going back to what I was saying before, um, they're not all the same width, right? Because the area of the actual box indicates how much is in the box. Okay. So that's what I think is a little confusing about Instagram, um, but it, they're important, right? They're useful. So this is something you want to learn and get used to, and whatever. So you can calculate what's in this bin by basically doing the area math. We'll talk about that more later. I don't think we talk about it now, but. So moving on to see kind of by comparison, we can do, we'll still do age, oops. And we'll still do, sorry, 
unit equals year. But then what would we do if we want to say equally spaced bins? So we're going to use, oops, no, equal sign, NP arrange again. And what, what should be the parameters to NPA range to get equally spaced bins of size, sorry, of size 10? Zero. Yeah. So almost, but we don't want to be disingenuous about it, right? So we're going to want to use 110, okay. right? So zero, one, 10, and 10. And so, oops, I got a friend. And so we use this 110, right? Because we want to be inclusive of all this all the way up to 100, but we need to go over 100. So therefore, we need to go 10 over 100 to be able to actually get the same size bit. Yeah. So I noticed on the, on the 25 one that we went to our one size. That's just kind of standard difference. You can or cannot. Oh, it's just the size of the bin. So in the hundred one, the the when you get to the hundredth position, that you have a bin that's only a one thing wide rather than twenty five things wide. Because the twenty five one was wrong. Oh, okay. Like as in it wasn't equally distributed. Yeah. Because I was I was trying to share something else. <laughs> Go ahead. So yeah, I was realizing that when I was going through this like just now with the numbers, that the highest one is actually 98. So we could actually stop at hundred and be okay, but then I wouldn't be able to show my example. So yeah. No, that's what I was just trying to explain. Is that, but, I mean, does it work? Yes. It's not the same width bin. It's only a right, it's only a, a one ish bin rather than a 10 bin. Make sense? Yeah. So it should always be like the bin size over the Probably, unless you're trying to do something weird. Right, but to her point, because of the nature of the data we have, we didn't actually need that bin. So it's kind of moved. So. Yeah. Sorry. I still can hear you. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and to be honest, the next thing I'm going to show you is how I would do it 95% of the time. So, um, and you don't have to figure it out. So this one's a little clearer, right? Because now we have a hexagram that's all kind of the same width because the bins are all the same size. Make sense? All right. And then for the super lazy, We can just do, oops. And it's going to guess. Okay. So the histogram tool will guess. It will use equally sized bins with no necessarily rhyme or reason that you may be able to follow as to what those sizes are, but they will be equal. Yeah. And all I did differently was just didn't specify the bin. Okay. So I just took whatever, whatever magic this function's doing to figure out the bin size. Now, the nice thing is this is open source. So you can actually go look if you're interested. Um, and uh, I think in a future le lecture, we'll demo that too. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So it looks at, well, no. It guesses based on the age. So like the, the data amount or the value or the counts really. <laughs> yep. 
Yeah, this, sorry, I think I may have missed said this. The unit here is really just like a decorator, like it's just a label. Uh, so it's really just a label for, so that when you see age here, you know that it means by year. Yeah. Change the y axis to count. What do you mean by count? Oh, you could. I mean, that would be a bar graph. Is that what you mean? Yeah. So, so you could. I mean, essentially, I am, but it would be a bar graph if it just was literally there. But it would take up a lot more room. Right. I mean, you can do that. Yes. Maybe see me some other point and we can talk about it more. Somebody else have a question? No. Okay. All right. Let's move on. Uh, oh, actually, we do have a nice little demo of maybe what you're talking about. It's, it's certainly close. Um, did you mean, did you mean basically that comment? That's not 100% what I heard, but this might be closer to what you want or what you're asking for. So, so this is printing out the table of the histogram in a sense. So the percent of the overall set of movies that are in this bin of zero to four, right? Zero, five, uninclusive, um, is 9% of the overall thing. So if you're on this, if you're on the histogram, you can calculate what percentage each one is, right? And so then you know how many there are in that total set. You take the 200, 9% of that, and that's how you get to um, the uh, like actual count, if that's what you want. Because really what you're looking for with the histogram, you, you usually, or at least in my opinion, right? Like you usually aren't looking for the actual values. What you're looking for is the distribution of it, okay? So in other words, there's a lot more movies that are very recent that are in that top grossing movie bucket, right? And there's a lot fewer when you go older. And if you think about it, like just in terms of population, right? So there's a lot more people now than there were 80 years ago. So as a result, there's more people spending money on movies. Movies are also probably a lot more popular now. So what you're, what you're curious about here is not so much, is this five, seven or 52 movies as much as that there's a lot more in the recent time than there are in the older time. Does that make sense? Because we're talking about the distribution, we're not talking about like the count of movies. We wouldn't probably, we'd be doing things more like bar graphs or scatters or something like that if what we care about understanding is, you know, other things about the movies like gross value or gross revenue or that kind of stuff. This is more about trying to see the distribution of those movies, the top movies, in what years? Does that help? Okay. All right. So let's do these. Not that one. All right. So a histogram in definition form, right, is a chart that displays the distribution of a numerical variable or attribute. Uh, it uses bins, and there's one bar corresponding to each bin, and it uses the area principle. So the area of each bar is the percent of individuals in the corresponding bin. Okay, so that's how you can tell the distribution of it, because if it's a higher percent, it's going to have a taller uh, graph element, right? And if it's a lower percentage, it's going to have a lower. One. All right. Now there is a question.
Oops. Sorry. All right, let's call it there. And so almost everybody has it right. Um, the area is proportional to the values they represent. Um, but we have more questions, I think. Oh, I thought we had another question. Wait, what? Oh, okay. All right. So that concept of like the, you know, that bar and how much stuff is in it is referred to as density. So by default, a histogram, the his function will use a scale that ensures the area of the chart comes to 100%. So you can change that. Do not recommend, but you know you can change it. There are some cases where you do. Um, the area of each bar is the percentage of the whole. So you know that it's a you know that picture is a chunk out of the whole, one hundred percent. And the horizontal axis is a number line. Uh, you know, for in this example, years. And the bin sizes don't have to be equal to each other. The vertical axis is a rate, as in percent per year. So like. You know how many how many top grossing movies were there per year? That's a rate, right? That's like how, how often it's occurring or how fast it's occurring, I guess. Um, and then we have another question, but we're going to wrap up pretty soon after this. All right, this is where you should know know your do's and don'ts, right? I will try harder to incorporate more bad jokes. All right, get those answers in. All right, I'm going to close it there because we're almost out of time. All right, so the answer is don't. So for anybody who said do, so the bin size can be any arbitrary sizes, right? You can have one, you can have, you know, two bins, one that's, you know, one and then one, you know, that's two billion. You know, like it, it doesn't really make any difference how big they are. Um, your histogram will come out quite differently, right? You'll get a very different, uh, you know, picture as a result. So make sure that the bin sizes or whatever are telling you what you want, you know, what you want the viewer to, to know. The thing to remember though is that the percent, right, the scale or the percent of the, of the box will still be representative of the percent of the thing in the total 100%, right? So in that way, that kind of offsets the fact that they're not the same shape. Does that make sense? So you can still get to the exact number in any given bin size by looking at the area of the, of the actual box that's created, okay? And Let's just talk quickly about this and then we'll come back to this next time. Um, but so this is how we calculate the height. Uh, and so this is hard to explain out loud. Um, so the bin contains 51 out of 200 movies, okay? In this particular case, in our example, right? So 52 out of 200 is 25 and a half percent. So the bin is 65 minus 40 or 25 years wide. So the height of the bar will be 20, 25 and a half percent divided by 25 years. Okay, so 25 and a half divided by 25. 
getting one person, you know, right around 1% per year. Okay, so that's how you figure out what the height should be. Because if you look here, right? So this is this is 1%, right? So that means that the bar should go up to about here. And I think we were talking about this one, right? So, you know, it seems right, but I'm not sure if it's the same bidding. All right, and so that's how you come to the height for any given one of the bars or how really his is calculated in the height, what's going on behind the scenes. And then, but the height kind of in reverse um, tells you the density of that, you know, of that bar or of that bin. So the height measures the percent of data in the bin relative to the amount of space in the bin. And then the height measures crowdedness or density. So in other words, like, if the bar isn't all the way to the top, it means there's empty space, right? That's why we talk about it in terms of density. Um, and the units, percent per unit on the horizontal axis. Um, yeah. The last row is the Where did I? Oh. Here? What did that what happened? Oh, it's a typo. It's just a it's just a typo. Sorry about that. Yeah, it took me a long time to see it, so it was a really effective typo. Um but uh, we'll revisit this next time. So don't stress about it too much. Um, and maybe I'll make some different slides. Um, yeah. Um, for the section of the lecture, we didn't get to get to the height on the future and output section. Are those going to be filled out for the one? No, what I usually do is cut it off and put it on the next lecture. All right. Um, why don't we then approach the questions regarding like, what's not in the whole lecture? Oh, is 